In this video, we'll discuss how to use materials to customize how RayDK renders scenes. This video builds on concepts from earlier videos in the series, so I recommend starting with those before watching this one, though you may still learn things even if you haven't seen the other sections. We're starting with the same basic render setup that we've used in previous videos. First, we'll set up some SDFs. In the palette, using the Alt-R shortcut, and create a torus SDF. Set the axis to Z, the radius to 1, and the thickness to 0 0.5. Open the palette again and create an arrange. And we're going to insert that between the torus and the renderer. We'll be using the range as a way to combine a few different SDFs. Make a copy of the Taurus SDF and connect it to the second input on the arrange. Then on the arrange, under the translate for the first input, we're going to set that to negative 1.5, 0, and 1. And then for the translate for the second input, we're going to go with 1.5, 0, and 0. Next, open the palette again and create a plain SDF. And then connect this to the third input on the arrange. And then on the third translate on the arrange, we're going to shift that down on the y axis to negative 1. Then on the camera, we're going to set the FOV angle to 60 and the position to 2, 3, 7. And on the point light, we're going to set the position to 2, 3, 3. Oh, we technically could have connected this the same Taurus SDF to multiple inputs here, and it would have made multiple copies of it. But for the sake of keeping things simple for the tutorial, we're going to keep them separate. So this gives us a few different SDFs to work on. Before we get started setting up our own materials, let's discuss how they're used in the render process. Recall from the concepts video how ray marching works by marching a ray from a pixel on the rendered image out into the scene until it hits a surface. And it does that by asking the SDF input about points along the way. So for a point up there, it would ask both of the toruses and the, and the plane and figure out which one is closest and then produce a distance like that. And so if the point was going kind of down and in, it would continue on at another point and so on, keep going until it hits something. Once the renderer identifies where the ray hit a surface, let's say right there, and if the ray was coming from there, then it needs to figure out what color it should produce for that pixel. And that's where materials come in. They help the renderer calculate a color for points on surfaces in the scene. Now we'll set up our first material. Open the palette and create a basic material. We're going to insert that between the torus first torus, and the arrange. So you won't see much of a change initially, and that's because the basic math's default settings are pretty similar to what the renderer uses in its default material. But try changing the base color, and you'll see that it changes the color of the surface in the renderer. For purposes of this example, let's pretend that the arrange isn't there, and it's just the first torus and the basic mat. When the renderer asks its input, in this case the basic mat, about a point in space, the basic mat turns around and asks its input, in this case the torus, about that same point in space. The torus does its calculations, and comes up with information about the surface, including how far away it is, as well as some other properties. It passes that answer to basic mat, 
And then basic mat takes that answer and modifies it, adding a note that says, by the way, when you're trying to figure out a color for this surface, check back with me and I'll help you out. Once the renderer decides that it's hit a surface, it looks at the properties of the surface to choose which material operator will help it figure out the color. So it does some initial calculations like where the light is and which direction that part of the surface is facing, aka the surface normal. And it packages up all that information and goes back to the basic mat and asks it what color that part should be. The basic mat uses that info and its own settings to calculate the color, factoring in things like the angle of the light hitting the surface. Then the Raymarch renderer uses that color for the output, and we see it in the rendered image. Now, the basic mat has a couple of extra features, including what's called skylight. Skylight is like a simplified secondary light source coming from a different angle. It allows you to apply a different color and specify a direction that it's coming from. So in this sky direction here, you can change the direction there and you can see how it kind of looks like there's a light source that's moving. So this isn't a proper light source and it doesn't have shadows or anything like that, but it is a quick and cheap way to add some additional coloring to the surface. And if you don't want to use the skylight, you can set the amount down to zero. Basic Mat works fine for simple setups, but it has limits. If you want more control over the shading, you can use what's called a modular material. Open the palette again and create a modular mat or modular material. We're going to insert that between the second torus and the arrange. So it will go dark initially, which is expected, since there's another step that we're going to need to take. Modular Matte lets you combine several different types of shading into a single material. But since we haven't added any shading yet, there's no color. Open the palette again and create a diffuse contrib. And we're going to attach that to the second input on the modular material. The modular mats second, third, and fourth, and potentially other inputs in different versions of the toolkit, all take in elements that contribute color to the surface. And that's where this contrib name comes from, that it's contributing light to the surface color. On the diffuse contrib, you can try out the different methods. The default here is this Lambert. There is also Orin Nair, which has a roughness setting and an albedo setting. So each of these represent a different way to calculate diffuse shading. Diffuse shading is one of the two most common kinds of shading, the other being specular. Now taking a look at this resource, and I'll include a link to that in the video description. You can see that specular reflection, kind of the light stays together and it goes off in one direction, whereas diffuse gets more spread out. So we've got another example here where if the specular reflection just comes off in one direction, whereas the diffuse gets kind of spread out. And in a case where there's no roughness, so it's a completely shiny material, the diffuse kind of ends up going in the same direction, kind of like specular. But as the roughness of the surface increases, the diffuse spreads out. And if it goes up high enough, it kind of cuts out most of the specular. So specular is more about highlights, whereas diffuse is more about shading the rest of the shape. Now we'll add some specular shading. Open the palette again and create a specular contrib. And we're going to connect that to the third input on the modular material. 
So you can try out the different settings and the different methods, which have different ways of calculating the light. Note that in some versions of the toolkit, Fong and Blinfong may have some errors in how they do their calculation, so they may look a little bit off. But the other methods should work fine. So each of those has different settings that control it. So you can see that when the roughness is all the way down, you get that kind of tight shine, whereas if it's higher up, it gets more spread out. So which methods you choose depends on your aesthetic preferences. I tend to use a combination of Orin Nair for the diffuse and GGX for the specular. This combination of one diffuse and one specular shading element is a fairly standard setup. It can produce some nice results if you vary the colors slightly between the two. So try changing the colors a bit with, say, a light yellow for the specular and maybe a light blue for the diffuse. And if we increase the roughness there, kind of adjust those settings, you can see that gives it a lot more depth than if it was just one constant color being used over the whole shape. When the renderer asks its input about the scene, so in this case it asks the arrange, which then asks each of its input and finds the closest one. Well, let's say that the second torus is the closest, so the question uh, about the surface comes into the modular mat, which turns around and asks the same question of the torus, which does the calculations and packages up a distance and some other information about the surface. Modular map, then similar to basic map, it adds its note saying that the renderer should check back with it when it's figuring out the color. So when the renderer hits the surface, it looks at the properties of it, and then in this case, it's going to see that modular mat is what it should be asking. So it packages up the information about the light and the angle, and then sends that over to modular mat. Now, unlike basic mat, modular mat doesn't do a whole lot of its own calculations. Instead, it asks each of its secondary inputs what color they are going to produce. So in this case, it first asks the diffuse, which uses its settings and the properties of the surface, and comes up with a color. Then it does the same thing with specular, does its calculations, comes up with another color. Then the modular mat adds up all those colors and passes that back to the renderer. And that's what appears in the final image. That's it for this section. In future sections, we'll cover other types of materials and shading elements. Stay tuned for the next video in the series. Check out my Patreon for access to Steam files, exclusive tutorials, and more. Thanks for watching, and make sure to like and subscribe.